good morning, everybody. <laughs> Come off the TV, okay, for a moment. Happy Thanksgiving. Praise God for those. And, and of course, what's Thanksgiving without a little bit of football, right? So there you go. For those of you that didn't watch the game last week, Cowboys and the Eagles, that was that happened. That was uh, Zeke Elliott. Early in the second quarter, I happened to be at a restaurant, looked up, and that just inspired me. And I just couldn't resist bringing that into today. We will talk about it later on, but for those of you that didn't see it, there you go. So, Thanksgiving and some football. Well, um, if you uh, are our guest today, thank you for being here. We're so glad you're here. Uh, maybe you're visiting family from out of town, and uh, if you are, then we're just glad that you came by and spent some time with us today to worship God. Um, I'm Joe Preston, one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to serve as your teaching pastor today. You know, as we get together as families and friends and so forth, and we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, um, isn't it amazing that now we've been doing this as a nation, as a country, for like 230 years, on and off, we've been celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, more of, of a national holiday, but certainly a religious to us as believe, a religious holiday to us as believers. But what's even more astounding is the very first Thanksgiving happened 390 seven years ago. That's like 400 years ago we had the first Thanksgiving service or time together. Guess why we had that? It wasn't because it was a national holiday then for those pilgrims who showed up in 1620. It wasn't because that it was a religious holiday and all that kind of thing. It was simply because they had a harvest. They got a harvest. You know, they came in in 1620. The first year they almost starved out. They almost died out that first winter. But thank God, after a lot of hard work, a lot of hoping in God, I mean, there were uh, crop failures and so forth, but eventually that, that first uh, six, uh, 1621 October, they got a harvest. They finally got results. And you know, I don't know if you're like me, but if you look around as far as harvest goes, whatever kind of harvest it might be, I've noticed something, that whatever it is that we're looking for, whatever we're believing God for, you know, it, it can, harvest can be like just right there. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's within arm's reach. We can almost just reach out and touch it. But sometimes it's like there's this one thing, like some sort of hurdle that just keeps us from bringing in the harvest, from reaching out and just taking hold of it. You know what I'm talking about? And that can get frustrating. I mean, you know, for, um, for you, uh, maybe harvest looks like um, a harvest of relationships, um, you know, Pastor Scott and Missy, the past two weeks, they talked to us about uh, marriage and how we need to come into alignment, alignment with God's word, alignment with each other and agreement and so forth. So maybe your harvest looks like relationships. Um, for others of us, maybe our harvest is health. Maybe there's just something in the way that seems like there's, there's symptoms that you've been trying to get over, just these nagging symptoms. Or maybe there's a, a diagnosis that you got a while back. And you're still dealing with it, and it's just like this, this blockage, this hindrance, this hurdle between you and your harvest of health that you're believing God for. For others of us, it may be as simple as, man, who could use some upgrades? You know, I'm talking about like maybe your car, maybe, maybe you don't even have a car, and you could just use a car kind of thing. Or maybe it's your house. I know at our house, we're doing some remodeling, okay? And uh, Elizabeth is very thankful about that, getting rid of those ugly kitchen counters. I couldn't even tell you what color they were, but they're gone now, so it's okay. We have very soothing white countertops, and it's wonderful. So maybe an upgrade in your house, maybe an upgrade in your job or something like that, but there's just sometimes we get frustrated because there's something between us and our harvest. Do you understand that? Do you see that? You know, for probably the past two or three months, Elizabeth and I have gone down a handful of times down to Lubbock and to uh, Plainview. There's a coffee shop in Plainview we absolutely love. Best cinnamon rolls in the state of Texas and probably beyond. But we go down there. We've gone down for shopping and different things. But going back and forth between here and Lubbock, you know, we're kind of in the heart of the panhandle cotton country, right? And so just going back and forth, I, I kept noticing over the past several weeks that, man, those fields were just like Jesus said, white unto harvest. I mean, cotton was just everywhere. They just kept getting bigger and bigger. We go back again, and it was bigger and bigger. And I'm like, why isn't this harvest time? You know, why aren't they bringing this harvest in? Well, lo and behold, what happened was, is remember all that water, that rain we've been believing God for and praying for? Well, guess what? It all came at once. And so all of a sudden, all the fields were flooded. And so it was just a few inches of water keeping these farmers from getting into their fields and getting hold of their harvest. I can't imagine how frustrating that was, that it was just right there. 
And this was supposed to be a record-breaking year for us. This is like a $3 billion industry we're talking about just in Texas alone. But you know, there was a hurdle, wasn't there? There was just a few inches that was keeping them away from their harvest. And I've noticed that that's what harvest can be like at times. We often deal with these hurdles that keep us from bringing in or reaping our harvest. You know, I think about Jesus. You know, even in his own life, he faced these same kinds of hurdles that we do as well. So today we're going to talk about one specific incident in his life. actually happened early on in his ministry, kind of earlier on in probably the first year or so of his ministry. And Jesus basically at this time has been, um, as we catch up into the story, he's been having a lot of harvest already. So he's gone out into ministry now. He's been going around into all the cities and villages and so forth, around the countryside, into Jerusalem and so forth. But um, as he's been going around, um, people have started catching on. They started catching on to his ministry. He's been preaching a lot, a lot of intense times together. Um, he's been ministering. There's probably, at this point, hundreds, even thousands of people have been healed in his ministry. In fact, just be, probably a, a few weeks before this event we're about to look at, a little girl got raised from the dead. So things are going on, spectacular things, and now tens of thousands of people are starting con to connect with Jesus. They're starting to follow him everywhere he goes. And so as we come into Mark chapter 6, there's, there's three accounts in Scripture and in, in the Gospels of this event that we're going to look at. But we're going to look at Mark chapter 6, picking up with verse uh, 45, because we find now Jesus has just fed nearly twenty to 30,000 people supernaturally. So the place is just going nuts. It's going crazy. But during this time, Jesus has this understanding, this knowing from his father that he's on one side of the lake of the sea, or, I'm sorry, the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, and now he needs to get to the other side. So all this has been going on. There's a major harvest to go on over there now. So he's got to get from point A to point B. So we pick up the story here in Mark chapter 6, verse 45. It says immediately after this, immediately after the, the big feast that they had where he fed about 30,000 people, the word says that Jesus insisted his disciples get back into the boat, head across the lake to Bethsaida where he sent, uh, while he sent his, uh, the people home. Verse 46, after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake. And this lake is like there's a stretch of about eight miles that they've got to cross over, okay, to get where they're supposed to get to. So they're out there in the middle of the lake. So in other words, they've gone about three or four miles and so they're out there in the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land back there on the shore. Verse 48, he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. But then about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them. Walking on the water, he intended to go past them. But when, they saw, when, he saw, or when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. And then he climbed into the boat. And the wind stopped, and they were amazed. i got to add to this, with these three other accounts of this passage, we find not only did the, the wind stop it, but it stopped immediately. Not only that, but as they just looked up, suddenly they were on the other side of the lake. In other words, what took them half the night, hours, struggling against the waves and the wind, suddenly it was just in an instant they were there. So they saw all this happen, and it says that they were totally amazed. So the point is, is Jesus made it, didn't he? Whether without his disciples, he was going to get over to that other side, one way or the other. He was going to get over there, and he was going to get what he, he was going to reach his destiny. He was going to get his harvest. He was going to get what was rightfully his. But given all these hurdles, I mean, there's eight miles of ocean or, or lake out there that he's got to get across. Okay, a storm blows in, and he's got a boatload of the scared disciples. So Jesus had some hurdles to go over, didn't he, to get to his, to get to his harvest. So how did he do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's pray. Um, the title of today's message is Harvest Time, How to Overcome the Hurdles to Our Harvest. Let's pray and we'll dig in. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this holiday, for this time as a nation that we gather alone together with you, with one another, and we just set our focus and our, our gratitude on you. Thank you for this nation. Thank you for the freedom that we do have. And God, now as believers, we come to this place pursuing you, asking you, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear. May our hearts and our minds be open to you and all that you have for us in this time. In Jesus' name. Can you agree with that, church? Amen. Praise God. So 
Thanksgiving is like the busiest time of the year, isn't it? Travel time, I mean, whether you're going to be driving somewhere or flying somewhere. And it just reminds me how we as Americans love our freedom, don't we? We love our independence. And it's like, thank the pilgrims for that and thank God for that too. But you know, what's interesting is um, when I think about this freedom, this freedom that we have, even down to today, this talk about freedom, even in our, uh, this midterm election that we just went through, there's still huge debate about our freedoms. About, I mean, there, we're dealing with challenges of thousands of people still trying to pour into our borders. What are they after? They're after that same freedom, that same opportunity that we seem to so casually enjoy, but that freedom that the pilgrims went after, that they came over and they finally lay hold of, that freedom is now part of our DNA. You know what I'm talking about? And so to kind of bring this home, you know, thinking about travel time and so forth, you know, I don't know if you, you fly a lot, you've traveled a lot um, on commercial airliners um, or had some, maybe some longer trips, you know, um, by flights. But um, one of my favorite things when I, you know, still to this day when I'm flying is to reach that cruising altitude about 33,000 feet. And all of a sudden, one of the um, uh, flight attendants gets on the, um, the intercom systems and says, ladies and gentlemen, the captain has now turned off the fasten seat belt sign. You're now free to move about the cabin, right? Don't you love that? Especially when, like for me, you know, I've got an early flight. I've got to be at the airport at 6 o'clock, you know, so I'm up at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, and, man, the first thing you're going to do is chug that tall glass of orange juice so you can fight, have some immune system, you know, boost to get over all those germs that you're going to be, you know, exposed to in the airplane. And then, man, after you get to the airport, it's like, where's my Starbucks? So you get through security. You know, how many have had your Starbucks taken away at security? And your pocket knife. Man, that makes me mad. You know, I always forget that. Do you know what I paid for that? Oh, my gosh. So you get past security. You go get your Starbucks. You get in line and so forth. And okay, I need to go get me a water. You know what I'm saying? Because I had all that, that sugar and that orange juice, and I've had all that caffeine. Mine was a venti. I don't know about yours. But, you know, so you got all that, that you know, caffeine, you know, flowing through you. And so, man, i got to start cleansing now, you know what I'm saying, to come down. But I do have five hours of flying time ahead of me. So you go through Starbucks, and, and they have the coolest, you know, like Fiji Island waters and core water things, you know, the latest stuff out there, and, and you know about the size of a baseball bat or something big that you can use to, to ward off hijackers if they're on your flight, you know, <laughs> but this huge bottle of water, you know, and so, I don't know about you, so you're chugging it down, you know, you're cleansing, you know, you get on the plane, and then you forget, okay, you know, I've got probably 20 minutes um, of, before I can be free to go do what I want to do, you know, and so, so you finally reach that cruising out to do, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the captain has turned off the fastened seatbelt sign. You're now free. And as soon as you hear that word free, it's like, thank God. And so all of a sudden, you're click, 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 click. All those buckles are coming loose, and, and bodies are popping up, all, and it's a fight to the bathrooms, right? <laughs> My son was so excited. The other, he came in last week, and he's like, Dad, there's now two bathrooms in the back of the airplanes. Or, you know, Southwest has gone crazy, giving us two bathrooms. So we're excited. We love that freedom. We enjoy our freedom as Americans. We love to be able to go where we want to go and do what we want to do when we want to do it, right? So that's freedom. But how many know sometimes we come up against hurdles, obstacles, hindrances, speed bumps, detours, whatever you want to call them, that keep us from our freedom, that keep us from sometimes even denying us access to our harvest in life, things that we're believing God for. So here's Jesus, same kind of situation, you know, he's dealing with a hindrance, a hurdle to his destiny, to his harvest on the, that's awaiting him on the other side. So, you know, as he's standing there, it just reminds me of, of and he's facing this, the Sea of Galilee, I think of Moses, okay? Same thing. Moses had this hurdle. It was called the Red Sea. He was trying to get the nation of Israel across the Red Sea, but there was this hurdle in, in the path of their freedom, of what God had for them. Same thing again, 40 years later, Joshua, you know, God says, yeah, you are free to move about the cabin. And then, so they're so excited, they pack up, and guess what? But now they've got to cross the Jordan River. So we see these kinds of obstacles, these hindrances, these hurdles throughout Scripture and in our own lives. But notice what Jesus does when he's faced with his own hurdles in life. Look at verse 46. The, uh, scripture tells us there that after telling everyone goodbye, Jesus went up into the hills by himself to do what? Pray. To pray. In other words, he got alone with God. You know, if you read throughout the, the Gospels, it tells us that Jesus, it was his custom to get alone with God and to, to pray, to have some face time with God, to get alone with him. And, and so it was a habit of his. 
What's he doing? Well, he's reconnecting with the Father. I mean, you go through a busy day, you know, and you come home to maybe your spouse or your kids or whatever, and, and it's, it's a good time to connect, right? You know, you need to reconnect. Well, that's what Jesus does. He goes through a busy season in life. He goes through harvest times in life. It's just crazy busy all the time. And, and so what he does is he gets alone and he begins to reconnect with the Father. He begins to refocus on the God of harvest, not on the harvest itself. He begins to refresh himself in the presence of God. So it brings us to our first point. Before you go out, you got to go up. Before you go vertical, or I mean horizontal, go out there into the harvest field, you need to go vertical. I, I like saying it this way. Before you go and step one foot into the harvest field, you need to plant two feet into the presence of God. You see that? Why is that? Well, because you get in God, you're going to find out some things. You're going to find out a plan for your harvest. You're going to find some provisions that God has for you for your harvest. You're going to find some power that you're going to need to be able to take in that harvest. Not only that, but you're going to find a plan. You're going to find some provisions, and you're also going to find the power to overcome any hurdles that you're going to have to engage an encounter along the way. Do you see that this morning? So here's Jesus. He's reconnecting with God. He's, he's um, refreshing himself in the presence of God. He's getting uh, refocused on his Father. But you know what? I believe also in that time, God does something special for him. How do I know? Because he's done it for me. He's done it for others. During this time of reconnecting, refreshing, and refocusing on God, God gives him some more of the assignment. He tells him some things. He starts to flesh out the details. He starts to give him some action plans. You know, Jesus, here's what I want you to see, son. So when you get over there, oh, by the way, this is what you need to get over there. So when you get over here, you're going to do this and this and this. You know, that's awesome. So that happens. But you know, there's a takeaway that I think that Jesus gets in this time of refreshing and reconnecting and refocusing with God. And it's simply this. Hey, Jesus, I want you to know this. God talking to his son. I've reached over. I've turned off the fasten seatbelt sign. And guess what? You're free to move about the cabin. You're free. You can do whatever it takes that you need to do to get over there and get that harvest. You know, I think about Scripture. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's awesome to walk around and, and, and have our Scriptures and our, our arsenal and our weapons against the enemy, right? But you know what? I think it's even more powering to us to not only have our Scriptures and quote those Scriptures, but to take that time and get in the presence of God who's going to bring that scripture to life. He's going to make that word consume you. His spirit is going to consume you and bring that word to pass in your life. So we need both of those things. So now I don't know what Jesus did after his time of being in the presence of God up that hill. You know, maybe he came down that hill and did the dash thing. You know what I'm saying? You know, dash of the Incredibles, the youngest boy who's got the superpower of running like a crazy maniac, you know, everywhere. And he can even run on water. So maybe Jesus came down, you know, and started power walking and then started hydroplaning across the, the Sea of Galilee. I don't know. Maybe he did the... Um, what's his name, Zeke Elliott thing. He just started hurling those waves, man. Just came down just hurling those waves. But the point is, is he, got, he got out there and he got caught up to the disciples. So verse 48 tells us that when he caught up to the disciples, what happened? He realized that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the winds and the wave. One other translation says that they were straining against the oars. Now, I'm going to talk some Greek today, Okay just about two or three times, it's important to understand because only one translation really tells us exactly what happens. When you get some in, into the Greek or original language, you begin to flesh out and get a really good sense of what was going on. So when it says that, he that they were struggling against the winds and the oar, I mean, straining against the oars, that Greek word there actually means that they were being harassed. Say harassed. harassed. They were being harassed. In other words, there was some unseen force there, there was somebody or something that was kind of working behind the scenes and that just seemed to be throwing one hurdle at them at, after another. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you've been harassed, like you're trying to get somewhere or do something and, 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 and there's this enemy, this force against you and just throwing up hurdles everywhere you go? Well, it's because there is an enemy. His name's Satan. He's been throwing up hurdles against us since the days of Adam and Eve throwing obstructions in our way, slowing things down, throwing us off a course, okay? And so that's what these guys are, so they're being, exper uh, being harassed. That's what they're experiencing. Now. Why? Because the enemy wants more to do more, no more than to steal, kill, and destroy your harvest. That's what he's trying to do to Jesus right here with all these issues that he's having to face, including his own disciples. 
Have you ever felt like you've been, not been able to, to reach your stride and, and finally find your stride because there's things in the way, things keeping you from your harvest? Well, take a look here. It says that um, Jesus, in verse 48, came toward them, walking on the water. Notice he didn't go to them. He's walking toward They're on the same tra uh, trajectory. They're headed in the same direction. So he's coming toward them. And then it goes on and says this thing, that he intended to go past them. Jesus was, he was going, going toward them. He was going the same direction, but he intended to go past them. Why was he doing it? I mean, Jesus, I mean, wouldn't that be disheartening? You're out there about to drown. You're going crazy. You, you're, you're worn out from fighting. You've been not doing this for hours. And here comes your champion of faith, Savior, Messiah is here. And there he goes. <laughs> what? <laughs> come on. Jesus, come on. What are you thinking? I mean, are you being some insensitive? Um, what would I write down? Insensitive, goal-oriented, type A personality, task-driven person who's going to go and get his harvest come hell or high water, literally, you know, and, and you know, he, if you want to go with him, fine. If not, fine. He's going to go do this thing. No, that's not who he was. That's not who he is. What you got to understand, when Jesus puts you in the boat and he sends you off toward your destiny, when he sets you on course to go and get your harvest, he's saying just one thing and one thing only. Hey, guys, I've turned off the fasten seatbelt sign. And guess what? You're free to move about the cabin. You can go and do whatever you need to do, just like his father told him, to go and get your harvest. See, his expectation was he wasn't going to have to stop off and help them out. His expectation was, guys, you got this. His expectation was, you know, any moment now, these guys over in the, these bozos over in this boat are going to wake up and realize something that happened just two chapters earlier. They're going to stand up, speak to the wind, tell the waves to shut up and be still so we can get to our harvest. Did they do that? Yeah, not quite. They didn't. Truth was, they weren't free to move about the cabin. Why? They were bound up. Take a look at verse 49. They were bound up by something. Well, verse 49 tells us that when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. I mean, Jesus, they're seeing him as a ghost. They don't even recognize him. Verse 50, they were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke up to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. In other words, they were so harassed by the enemy that they were frozen with fear. They were paralyzed, barely inching toward their, their harvest where they were supposed to be going to their destiny. That brings us to our next point. Second point is this. Fear is a hurdle to your harvest. Fear is a hurdle to your harvest. Why is that? Because fear robs you. Fear robs you of your focus. Fear robs you of your focus of your harvest, your, your destiny, and it allows the enemy to steal and to kill and to deny you access to your harvest. Now I want to say this. Fear is the hurdle. Okay? Time, money, your health, or should I say the lack of time and money and, and health, that's not usually your, your, your hurdle. Your spouse, your ex-spouse, your lack of a spouse, lack of a partner, they are not your hurdle. Your boss, your coworkers, your job, your lack of a job is not your hurdle. Moses, the Red Sea is not your hurdle there, bud. Joshua, it's not the, the, Jordan, the River Jordan. That's not your hurdle. Pilgrims, it's not the Atlantic Ocean. Fear is public enemy number one to a believer. Fear is the primary, I could almost say the only hurdle that you really face when it comes to getting to your harvest. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to prove this out to you, okay, in Scripture. And it's just to drive this point, point home. You know, in other passages, like I talked about, there's three other accounts of this very incident. Peter, in this, in the, this moment before, you know, Jesus goes over and gets in the boat, Peter, you know, got some chutzpah about him, okay? So he stands up and he goes, Jesus, if that's really you, 
call me out of this boat and to walk over there with you on the water. Jesus says, yes, Peter, it's me. And I can just imagine Peter. Oh, shoot. I just, I was, I knew he was going to say that. I've got to get out now. But guess what? Peter got out. And man, the boy's walking on water. You know, he's doing pretty good. Why? He spoke, man, Jesus is doing this. I can do this. I am free to move about the cabin. I can do this. I got this. And about that time, a spray some of the wave just went by and smacked him in the face. And what happened? Lost his focus. Started looking more at the surroundings of what's going on around here and over there. And what began to happen? He began to sink. The word tells us he began to sink. Why? Because he lost focus. So again, fear is a hurdle to your harvest. So Jesus didn't come by that morning to, to, to jump in the boat and, and to encourage his disciples, to comfort them because they were afraid. No. Jesus didn't swing by to, to hop in and catch a ride with the guys. No, that's not what he's doing. Jesus changed course. He got off task for a moment to go over there and wake those boys up. He went over to give them a wake-up call. Let's see what that wake-up call was, and we'll start wrapping it up here. Verse 50, again, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Take courage. What? Read it out loud to me again. I am here. here. What you got to understand, we're going to look at some Greek again, okay? Can Can you take a little bit more Greek? Just paquito, something of Greek, okay? Just a little bit more. Jesus is not saying, hey, guys, have no fear. Jesus is here. Messiah is here. Savior is here. Deliverer is here. That's not what he was saying. The Greek, and there's only one translation I could find other than Greek, that says this. The literal translation of what Jesus says is, don't be afraid. Take courage. The I am is here. The I am is here. Now, Jesus would acknowledge, I am the son of I am. I have the spirit of I am, but I I am not I am. There is no one I am except the I am. Now, I've got a question for you. Open book test. Who is the I am? God. I am, the I am, is God's calling card. It's only him of the Trinity. He's the I am. We find that out back in, all the way back into Exodus chapter 2 and 3 where God introduced himself to Moses the first time. God gave Moses the talking stick or the power stick, I would say, the staff that was in his hand. and He could do all kinds of powers and miracles and things and signs and wonders with his, his staff. And so that wasn't enough for Moses. He said, okay, this is great. People are going to love it. It's going to get a lot of attention, but there's one thing I need to know. Who do I tell sent me? God said, tell them I am because they didn't want Moses to come. They didn't like Moses. Who are you to come to be our deliverer? He said, I am sent me. And they're like, oh, okay, well, different story. So Jesus was saying this day on this, at this moment, the I am is here. God is here. He was saying again, and I wanted you to see this. Bring that back up there. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. The I am is here. And I am is here not because I have arrived on the scene. I am is here because you've been here. I am has been here all along. You just haven't been aware of I am. You see the difference there? That's huge. Well, why were they not aware that I am was there? It's obviously that it's obvious that Jesus expected them to know. God is here. What takes us to our our third and final point. Fear is the absence of your awareness of God. Does that seem complicated? Fear is the absence of your awareness of God? I don't think so. I can say it like this. The less aware you are of God, the more prone you will be to fear. Say it the other way. The more afraid you are, the less aware of God you will be. Now, let's not get all spiritual about this, okay? I'm going to bring this down to something that I think everyone in this room can relate to. Have you ever been scared? Don't give me your faith confession that I'm, I fear nothing. Have you ever been spitless scared where you couldn't say anything? You about messed in your pants? Maybe you did. 
I don't know. But you were so scared, so shocked, so frightened. Maybe it was one of those stupid movies that you went to. I was there too, okay? You know, just shaking and throwing your popcorn everywhere. You good reason to huddle up to your girlfriend or boyfriend. But you got so scared. And what happened when you got so a flashlight tag, whatever it was? What happened? What were the symptoms on your body? Every hair stood to attention and said, we're scared. We don't know about you. And then you had goosebumps on top of your goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And it was just like your back was a xylophone. It was just, uh, chills going up and down and up and down, right? Can anybody in here relate that, to that other than me? Have you ever been there before? That's fear. That's the reality of fear. Let me ask you a simple question. How aware of the presence of I am were you at that time? <laughs> were you aware of I am? You may have wanted to be. You may have, may have been saying, dear Jesus, deliver me from this situation. That's your confession, but your body's saying, I'm scared. Get me out of here, okay? You know what I'm saying? Hold on to that thought. Hold on to that feeling. But see, our bodies are designed to respond in that way for a reason, We'll come back to that, but first I want to tell you this. Take a look at 1 John 4, 8, what it says there. God is love. That's simple. We know that. But look what he goes on in verse 18 and says. There is no fear in love. In other words, we can say there is no fear in God, right? Would you agree that there is no fear in God? Okay. Then it goes on and says, but perfect love casts out or drives out fear. In other words, the closer you get to God, the closer you are in relationship with him, that man, it just drives all fear out. There's nothing to fear. No one but God, the word says. So there is no fear in God. The truth is, is you cannot be connected to God in fear at the same time. You cannot be connected to God in fear at the same time. Fear does not exist in God. It cannot exist in God. So Jesus said, take courage. The I am is here. Look at verse 51. Then Jesus climbed into the boat. Oh, come on, catch this. Listening ears up, okay? Jesus then climbed into the boat. The wind stopped. Whoa. It stopped immediately. Storms don't just do that. They were on the other side. How did we do that? And it says, what? Where is it? Verse 51. It's in the corn there. Do you see it? Verse 51. It's right. <laughs> Verse 51 says, then Jesus climbed into the boat and the wind stopped and they were totally amazed. They were totally amazed. Now, this is not Cheech and Chong, you know, <sighs> taking a hit. Wow, dude, I'm like totally amazed. You see what I'm seeing, dude? The storm is like gone. The boat, it's like we were, and now we're, oh, dude, come on, talk to me. You getting the same vibe I am? That's not what they were saying. No. This word here, one more Greek thing, okay? It says that they were stunned with fear. That's what that word means, amazed. It means that they were stricken dumb with fear. I should have used dumb and dumber maybe in this one. <laughs> but they were stricken with fear. Why? Because the enemy was harassing them? No. Totally different set of circumstances and situations. A miracle has just happened before their eyes. The storm, Jesus got in the boat. Last time he did that on the same spot, they got scared again because they were like, who is this guy that the storms even, the waves and the wind obey him? He got in the boat this time. It all stops. The sea's calm. Nothing's going around, and they're at the place where they're supposed to be. They became strict. The word literally means to be beside yourself. It's like an out-of-body experience. They don't know what to think. They don't know what to say. So when you were at that movie and you were stricken with fear and you were stunned because you were being hurt, because there was a dark force working against you and it manifested in your body and on your body. But here we are, the same thing's happening to them again. 
Your body is designed to respond out of the awareness of God the same way it responds to fear. That fear is a perversion on your body, what it's designed to do. Do you know you can have that same experience where you have goosebump upon goosebump upon goosebump and the, the, your spine just chills running up and down? It's happening to me right now. I practiced this the whole time I was practicing this message because I can shut my eyes right now and every hair, there they go, is standing on in because I've trained myself. I've worked with God. I've done what Jesus has done. Maybe you've done this too. Here he is. I am. I am is here. Suddenly, what the enemy tried to control, they, he had no control over. These guys are now so... When Jesus got in that boat, what did he do? He brought an awareness into that boat. He didn't just say, I am is here, and, and wake them up to it. He brought his own dose of presence of I am, which in, you can do. You can carry your own dose of presence of I am everywhere you go. And when he got in that boat, suddenly they were aware God is here. Totally changed the atmosphere and their physical environment. Praise God. Today, I believe the Lord would say this to us. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now free to move about the cabin. Amen. You're free to overcome any hurdle between you and your harvest that God's promised you. You're free to run through any hindrance, to reap any harvest, to jump any hurdle. You're free to do that. But the question is, how free are you to move about the cabin? How free are you to move about the cabin? How aware of God are you today that I am is here? Maybe you'd say to me, Pastor Joe, you know, I have never, ever sensed the presence of God. Have you ever been afraid? It's kind of the same thing. It's what you've been designed to do, to discern, to sense and feel, even physically, God's presence. Hallelujah. So it's time then. It's time for you to begin. You know, as, as disciples of Jesus, as fully devoted followers of Christ, folks, that's what our walk of faith, this journey of faith is all about. It's about connecting with God and then getting closer and closer and closer to him. Amen. To where you are more aware of him than you are of anything and every, anyone around you. You see this this morning? Amen. Praise God.